A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled Crisis in Kyrgyzstan, Fuel, Contracts and Revolution Along the Afghan Supply Chain will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the Subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record and without objection that too is so ordered. So good morning, everybody, and particularly our witnesses. I want to thank you again for being here today and helping to enlighten us on a region of the world that many Americans have not had an opportunity to uh, study in depth. So today's hearing will explore the recent revolution in Kyrgyzstan, the causes of the political turmoil there, and Kyrgyzstan's critical role in the supply chain for the United States and NATO's war effort in Afghanistan. Although, Ambassador, you made the good point that that cannot be the only and the sole focus uh, of our relationship. In addition, we'll examine the political and geopolitical significance of allegations of corruption in connection with the United States fuel contracts at the Manas Air Base in Kyrgyzstan. That is, of course, a critical transit and resupply hub for Operation Enduring Freedom. Last Monday, the subcommittee announced a wide-ranging investigation into allegations that the contractors who supply fuel to the Manas Air Base had significant financial dealings with the family of deposed President Kermanbek Bikiev. I understand from press reports that the interim government in Kyrgyzstan has announced its own investigation into allegations of corruption in the Bakiev regime, including the Manos fuel contracts. Of course, allegations of corrupt practices among Kyrgyz public officials are an internal Kyrgyz matter. However, some of the present allegations raise serious questions about the Department of Defense's management and oversight of contractors along the Afghan supply chain. Today's hearing will not answer the who, what, and where of the contractual dealings at Manus. You will also not test the veracity of allegations that are swirling around in Central Asia. These questions will be answered in due course by the subcommittee's ongoing investigation. Rather, the purpose of today's hearing is to look more broadly at the recent revolution in Kyrgyzstan, the Kyrgyz-American relations, the history of the United States presence at Manus, and the significance of the allegations of corruption at the base as a driver of the revolution. Since 2001, Kyrgyzstan has been a critical ally of the United States in support of our ongoing military efforts in Afghanistan. The Manus Air Base is a crucial hub for United States troops going in and out of Afghanistan as well as a refueling station for the United States and NATO aircraft operating in the region. Not unexpectedly, Kyrgyzstan's willingness to host the United States Air Base on former Soviet soil has generated some domestic controversy in Bishkek and even more controversy in Russia, which looks suspiciously at the United States' influence in Central Asia. As the United States has increased its presence in Afghanistan, our dependence on the Manos Air Base and the Northern Distribution Network, that of course is the supply chain to Afghanistan through Central Asia, has also increased. The United States' dependence is particularly acute at Manus. In March 2010 alone, 50,000 United States troops transited in and out of that base to Afghanistan. So let's be honest. At many times throughout our history, the United States has closely dealt with unsavory regimes in order to achieve more pressing policy or strategic objectives. That's realism in a nutshell. But the United States also prides itself on a more enlightened view of our role in the world and our long-term interest in universal respect for democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. Some suggest the United States has allowed strategic and logistical expedience in Kyrgyzstan to become a lasting embrace of two corrupt and authoritarian regimes. Regardless of U.S. intent, we're left with the fact that both President Akiev and President Bakiev were forcefully ousted from office amid widespread public perception that the United States had supported the regime's repression and fueled, I say that without any pun intended, their corrosive corruption. Meanwhile, the leaders of Kyrgyzstan's political opposition, the men and women who bravely confronted President Bakiev for his corruption and oppression, we're left in the lurch. Today, many of those opposition leaders are in power, and I expect the United States will have to work hard to restore our credibility in their eyes, beginning with transparency regarding United States fuel contracts at Marnus. I wish them the good judgment to transform the art of Kyrgyz governance in a manner deserving of the Kyrgyz people. Ultimately, it's my belief that only transparency will help Kyrgyz American relations move forward to a new page. And toward that end, I look forward to our witnesses' thoughts on the future of this important alliance. And with that, I'd like to yield to Mr. Flake for his opening remarks. I thank the chairman and thank the witnesses for coming. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is uh, 
at a turning point, it seems. Um, I think we're all hopeful that political stability will come. Um, we have a vested interest, as the chairman mentioned, certainly with the air base uh, as a supply hub uh, for our operations in Afghanistan. Um, the existence of a U.S. base in a former Soviet uh, territory has uh, been troublesome uh, for Russia. Uh, to make matters worse, there's the long-standing allegations that uh, former uh, leadership uh, benefited illegally from Department of Defense fuel contracts, as has been mentioned. So there's no easy solution here, uh, particularly given the air base and the situation we have there. But uh, I look forward to any light that can be shed on the situation and what we can do as members of Congress uh, to, uh, to make sure that we have a, a secure situation for uh, our war efforts in Afghanistan and, and also to help lend stability to the uh, situation there. I yield back. Well, thank you, Mr. Flake. The Chair recognizes Mr. Turner for your unanimous consent request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to request unanimous consent to make an opening statement. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to thank you and the ranking member for holding this hearing on what is a very important issue. And I'd like to pause for a moment to recognize in the back of the room we have uh, Dr. Conroy and her AP government class uh, from Georgetown Visitation. They are all seniors who are here today uh, participating uh, in the hearing, and they include my daughter, Jessica Turner. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, allowing me to recognize well, them. Well, the committee welcomes all the members of that class as well as their faculty, and uh, we hope you enjoy your stay in Washington and, and uh, appreciate uh, Jessica, your dad's good work on this committee. He does uh, really in-depth work and has, has been a leader here, and so we appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, for the last nine years, Kyrgyzstan has continued to assist the U.S. with our efforts in Afghanistan. Successive governments in Bishkek have resisted tremendous pressure from some other governments who would prefer the U.S. military bases be evicted from Central Asia. As a member of the House Armed Services Committee, I am frequently reminded of the critical contribution the Manas Transit Center makes to supplying the U.S. and NATO troops in Afghanistan. I was further reminded of Kyrgyzstan's strategic location during my visit there several years ago. Manas also plays a vital role in providing security and military assistance to the Afghan people. By doing so, this facility and U.S. presence there helps the Kyrgyz security. We are grateful for Madame Utenbayev's recent statements. The lease for use of the transit center will continue for another year. This assurance comes at a critical time in the buildup of U.S. and allied counterinsurgency forces in Afghanistan. Furthermore, Manas creates other opportunities for the Kyrgyz public, including economic benefits such as jobs, salaries, and good services procured, as well as humanitarian assistance provided by the military personnel base there. For example, the U.S. service members have assisted local orphanage by don orphanages by donating their time and money. However, our relationship with Kyrgyzstan and with Central Asia as a whole should not be seen exclusively through the prism of U.S. bases there or as an adjunct of our Afghan policy. Currently, the Defense and State Departments group Central Asia in the same bureaus and divisions of Afghanistan and Pakistan. This organizational structure may act as an enabling factor for administration officials to pigeonhole Central Asian countries as simply a corridor to get to Afghanistan. We should have in place policies and strategies that look at Central Asian states as countries that have their own unique cultures, challenges, and possibilities. One of these possibilities is helping and encouraging the Kyrgyz people to create economic opportunity. Kyrgyzstan has little economic means today. The Kyrgyz people need economic opportunities and jobs to achieve long-term stability. Stability is in America's and NATO's military interests. Economic development is going uh, would help uh, perpetuate stability. Prosperity and stability in Kyrgyzstan is also in America's and Europe's economic interest. Most of the highways already exist um, for um, transportation. There is required investment that should assist the, the better border management and supporting infrastructure. And border control would also help stem narcotics flow out of Afghanistan, an issue that, that I am concerned about. To help the Kyrgyz invite more investment, its democratic friends around the world, including the United States, must help its government to increase transparency. I hope that the administration and non-government organizations, some of which are represented at this hearing, will assist the Kyrgyz Republic in creating ways that provide transparency for commercial transactions. This concludes working with the new interim authorities to determine a way forward that eliminates any suspicion of wrongdoing by any party to remove lingering doubts the U.S. directly or indirectly condones con uh, corruption. In the near future, I will hope we will also be able to hear from administration officials to outline and describe U.S. strategies in the region. We need to ensure that we have a strategy not only to help Kyrgyz and its neighbors, but a strategy which continues to build upon and cultivate U.S. relationships in the region. Again, I want to thank the Chairman uh, for holding this hearing. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Turner. Is there any other member who would like to ask for unanimous consent for an opening statement? Otherwise, we have the opportunity to place them on the record, of course, as usual. The subcommittee will now receive testimony from the panel that is before us today. 
uh, a brief introduction of each of them to, to begin, uh, starting with Dr. Eugene Husky. He's the William R. Keenan, Jr. Chair of Political Science at Stetson University in Florida. He also serves as an associate editor for the Russian Review and is a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Communist Studies and Transition Politics. Dr. Husky's work focuses primarily on transition politics and legal affairs in the former Soviet Union and its successor states of Russia and Kyrgyzstan. He's the author of several books and has published dozens of articles about the political affairs of Kyrgyzstan and other former Soviet states. He has been asked to speak before the CIA, the Department of State, and numerous universities in Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Europe, and the United States. Dr. Husky received a BA from Vanderbilt University, an MA from the University of Essex, and a PhD in politics from the London School of Economics and Politics. Ambassador Bakhtabek uh, Abdesayev is a distinguished visiting professor of history and political science at Utah Valley State College. From 1996 until 2005, he served as the Kyrgyz ambassador to the United States and Canada. And from 1995 to 2000, he was a member of the Kyrgyz parliament. Prior to that, Ambassador Abdesayev was appointed director of Kyrgyzstan's International Affairs Department under former President Askar Akayev. Ambassador Abdesayev specializes in international relations, diplomacy, and Central Asian comparative politics. He has published dozens of scholarly articles and op-eds on Kyrgyz politics. He is the author of Kyrgyzstan's Voice in Washington, Reflections of the Kyrgyz Ambassador on Bilateral Relations During the Transition Year. Ambassador Abdesayev holds a BS from the Bishkek Polytechnical Institute, a PhD from the Institute of Electronics, Academy of Sciences of Belarus, and an honorary professorship of the International Univers University of Kyrgyzstan. And Ambassador, I want to express the committee's uh, sympathies. I know you had personal losses uh, during this latest uh, uprising over there and lost three close members of your family and friends and amongst others. And so we extend our sympathy to you on that. I know this is difficult testimony for you today and a difficult period of your life. And we thank you for taking time out to share with us your experience and your, your knowledge of this area because it was, in fact, you that first uh, negotiated the agreement with respect to Manus. So you have particular um, insight for us on that. Thank you. Dr. Alexander Cooley is an Associate Professor of International Relations at Barnard College at Columbia University and is currently a Global Fellow with the Open Society Institute. His areas of expertise are the political transformation of post-Soviet Eurasia, the politics of United States overseas basing, and theories of contracting and organization. Dr. Cooley has written two books, including Base Politics, Democratic Change in the United States Military Abroad, which examines the political impact of United States military bases in overseas host countries, including Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. He obtained his BA from Swarthmore College, a Master's in Philosophy from Columbia University, and a PhD from Columbia University. Scott Horton is an attorney, a lecturer at Columbia Law School, and a contributing editor for Harper's Weekly. Mr. Horton is known for his work in emerging markets and international law, especially human rights law and the law of armed conflict. He is a lifelong human rights advocate and co-founder of the American University in Central Asia, where he currently serves as a trustee. Mr. Horton is also a member of the board of the National Institute of Military Justice and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Horton holds a BA from the University of Maryland and obtained his JD from the University of Texas following studies at the University of Munich and Mainz in Germany as a Fulbright Scholar. And Sam Patton is the Senior Program Manager for Eurasia at Freedom House. From 2008 to 2009, Mr. Patton served as a Senior Advisor for the Democracy Promotion at the Department of State. Prior to that, he headed the International Republican Institute's Moscow office and directed its political programming in Baghdad from 2004 to 2005. Mr. Patton has also helped manage democratically focused campaigns in Ukraine, Georgia, Romania, Albania, and northern Iraq. And prior to his international career, Mr. Patton served as an advisor to Senator Susan Collins and a speechwriter to Senator Olympia Snow. Uh, Mr. Patton obtained his BA from Georgetown University. So we have a lot of firepower here today. We expect to uh, really learn a lot. And again, we want to thank you for being here, sh uh, sharing your uh, expansive expertise. It is, of course, the uh, policy of the committee to swear in witnesses before they testify. So I ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will please reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Again, I remind you that your full written statement will be put into the hearing record, and I appreciate as to the members of the committee how extensive those written remarks were and how helpful they are in, in getting our uh, background together. We'll allow about five minutes for opening remarks. 
The light will turn will be green. And with a minute to go, it'll turn to amber. And when the five minutes are up, it'll turn to red, and the floor drops. And out you go. Uh, but basically, we won't do that. We, we're appreciative of you being here. We'll add some latitude on that. But we do want to get to a point where we can have some questions and answers exchanged back from the committee members to the panel. So uh, Dr. Husky, will you please start? You, you need to turn the microphone on. Thanks. Great. And pull it a little closer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Flake, and subcommittee members for giving me the opportunity to speak about U.S.-Kyrgyz ties and about the country of Kyrgyzstan, which I've been studying for the last two decades. Much of my testimony today is based on interviews that I conducted with three dozen members of the Kyrgyz opposition during the last two years. Many of those interviewees have now assumed prominent posts in the new government, and five of them make up the new collective leadership of the country. We are here today because the United States tried to please a dictator. We all understand that difficult decisions have to be made in wartime, but our embrace of the Bakiyev regime in Kyrgyzstan was far tighter than it needed to be in order to retain our basing rights in that country. This became clear to me when I began interviewing uh, opposition leaders in July 2008. They complained that for the first time in the post-communist era, they were shunned by the U.S. Embassy in Bishkek. In late April 2009, the opposition candidate for president, Almaz Atambayev, told me that neither he nor other opposition politicians had been able to meet with the new U.S. ambassador, even though she had been in her post for more than six months. Atambayev was by no means a radical politician. He was a former prime minister and a successful businessman. He is now, in fact, the first deputy leader of the interim government, the number two man in the country. I heard the same refrain of isolation from the heads of NGOs in Bishkek. They had become untouchables in the eyes of the United States government. These NGO leaders were smart, energetic, and anxious to take their country in a liberalizing direction. With the US, U.S. Embassy out of the picture, the Russian Embassy in Bishkek stepped into the breach, and for the first time, Russian diplomats started to cultivate contacts in the Western-oriented NGO community. This was the opening gambit in what would become a more balanced Russian policy towards government and society in Kyrgyzstan. In spite of our numerous concessions to the Bakiyev regime, including the granting of lucrative contracts that are the subject of today's hearings, I would argue that the recently vented anger of Kyrgyz leaders and ordinary citizens over the airbase does not reflect an inherently um, anti-American sentiment in the country. It derives instead from a sense that the United States betrayed its own principles and the forces of change in Kyrgyzstan in order to curry favor with a despotic ruler who held the key to the airbase. It also, I should add, reflects popular frustration with a decade-long history of Kyrgyz presidents selling or leasing pieces of the country's territory to the highest foreign bidder. These bidders have included Russia, Kazakhstan, China, Uzbekistan, and the United States. Let me turn finally to a few of the issues that will shape the future of the air base and U.S.-Kyrgyz relations more broadly. First, it is vital that the interim government in Bishkek consolidate its authority throughout the country. The air base cannot function properly against the backdrop of sporadic civil unrest, never mind a civil war. The country is deeply divided along north-south lines, and pockets of resistance to the revolution remain in the south. Because the revolution was made in the north by northerners, and because the deposed president was from the south, there is great concern in the south that the interest of this historically disadvantaged region will not be fully represented in Bishkek. The interim government has made a good start by including two leaders from the south in its senior ranks, but there is still much work to do. Second, who rules Kyrgyzstan and how will be determined in the next six months by the introduction of a new constitution and the holding of new elections. The new constitution is likely to strip the presidency of much of its power and strengthen the parliament. This should make politics more competitive, but it may also complicate future negotiations over the air base. The United States administration may need to gain the support of a coalition of parties instead of a single individual as in the past. As elections grow closer, 
The tensions within the collective leadership will increase because the focus of the rulers will shift from governing to campaigning for their party or for the presidency. It is at this point that the system is likely to be at its most fragile. And there will be the greatest temptation for Kyrgyz politicians to use the airbase at Manas as a whipping boy in order to advance their own electoral prospects. It's in the interest of the United States, then, to have a thorough and early airing of our misdeeds with regard to the base and the Bakiyev regime. We do not want the next elections in Kyrgyzstan to be swayed by an October surprise that could reveal embarrassing details of our earlier policy toward the country. I welcome, therefore, your efforts to investigate our policies towards the Bakiyev regime. I also welcome the early signs from the administration that we will be pursuing a new strategy of engagement with governments and societies in Central Asia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. We appreciate your remarks. Ambassador. <coughs> Dear Mr. Chairman, Dear Ranking Member Flake, dear members of the uh, subcommittee, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to express my uh, sincere gratitude for uh, inviting me to testify before your committee on the recent change of government in Kyrgyzstan and its impact for the U.S.-Kyrgyz relations. When um, upheaval of April 6-7 happened in Kyrgyzstan, I was teaching my students in Utah at Utah Valley University. And uh, this time, in comparison with the events five years before, the uh, regime of the deposed President uh, Bakiev, as he promised, used uh, live ammunition against protesters. And uh, uh, soon, like many others in Kyrgyzstan, I felt a great pain from it. Among those who fell, uh, struck by the two bullets in the head, was uh, my nephew, 35 years old uh, uh, Rustan Shambetov. One of my wife's cousins, Mirlambek Turdalev, 21 years old, uh, who was uh, raised as an orphan in Jalalabad, the same city from which uh, the president, deposed President Bakiev, was also struck. Then uh, one more person, Joel Dashbek Kudaybergenov, 36 years old, journalist, who was just witnessing that process and tried to write uh, uh, some uh, news about that. He was uh, struck by the bullet. So uh, this is also the proof that uh, there were uh, so many people there involved, not just uh, the crowd and mob, but uh, many people who are just sincerely, genuinely uh, trying to uh, uh, witness the changes and what's going on. So uh, the upheaval uh, cost uh, for us dearly 85 uh, people uh, so far, and uh, hundreds and hundreds still uh, there in the hospitals. And now the Kyrgyz people there um, want, first of all, accountability for the government, which was undermined by corruption and nepotism, and uh, also a uh, government which authorized the use of lethal force against a uh, protested uh, citizen. But they also want a new government, and uh, they have high expectations from the people who are now in uh, government interim, who would restore democratic freedoms, assure free access to the market, and end the system of corruption and patronage. And they're also asking questions. Uh, most important, is America truly our friend? And uh, if so, then, first, America should demonstrate its commitment to democracy and the values of an open society with more than just words. Second, America should also remember that Kyrgyz civil society despite uh, to the questions, quite a uh, uh, sharp one and uh, uh, not pleasant about the procurement contracts, etc., still continues to view America as a model for emulating. Third, America should remember that its support, for example, for education in Kyrgyzstan has had a far more positive impact on our country than the transit center. U.S. founded American University in Central Asia is now among the most prestigious universities in Central Asian region, and uh, America can show it cares about our country, but continuing such generous support for education where it's shaping our country's future. And as far as uh, the uh, base MANA is concerned, I would like to remind you first that its major aim was and still continues to be to support U.S. military operations in the war in Afghanistan, and as a result of that, to maintain security for the Kyrgyz Republic against external threats that originate in that country. Therefore, from the beginning, the air base operation, the issue of payment was never our primary concern. 
The Kyrgyz government was focused on the threat to its own soil and population originated from Afghanistan starting from 1999 when the, for the first time we experienced the incursions of the Al-Qaeda to our uh, soil and as a result of the three years before that 9-11 we experienced such an attacks and we lost 55 lives of our people in uniform and citizens. So therefore when the uh, United States uh, came with uh, such a proposal we uh, welcomed that and said as a uh, President Akayev mentioned in 2002 during his visit to Washington DC at CSIS that uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan will make its own contribution in the fight with this great evil terrorism and we are not asking for the money uh, because uh, this is our own fight for the triumph of democracy and the right to enjoy its fruits to live in peace and prosperity and I'm really grateful to you though, for um, Again, uh, having these hearings when we uh, talk why and how the issues from such kind of strategic importance now shifted to uh, the issue about the uh, so-called corrupted practices from both sides. And uh, I know that my colleagues, they have a lot of uh, to offer. But uh, my, again, uh, main message, uh, we have to uh, restore our cooperation in wide range uh, uh, issues. And uh, where the uh, issue of the base is uh, extremely important for us uh, to continue to keep its presence again as a uh, 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 strategic uh, importance for us against the threat from Afghanistan but at the same time to pay attention to other areas education political and uh, economic reforms which could uh, help for the country to continue to be advanced as uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, country uh, uh, in the Central Asia which deserve its own uh, right and place in the international community thank you much Thank you very much, Ambassador. Dr. Cooley. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, distinguished members of the subcommittee uh, for this privilege of addressing you today. I'm a political scientist who has studied the Manasseh Air Base since its establishment in 2001 and studied it in a comparative context, uh, viewing developments related to the base in comparison to other bases that we have in places like East Asia, Southern Europe, and other post-communist states. Regrettably, it is not surprising that the U.S. military presence has become intertwined with allegations that the U.S. supported the repressive and corrupt rule of President Korman Bakiev. Um, and at the same time, I do believe we have the opportunity now, if we act, um, I think, with some foresight and we act aggressively, to salvage the base. Um, I think it's important at the outset to understand that the base has come to mean different things for Kyrgyzstan and the United States. For us, it's naturally this important, vital hub uh, to support mission in Afghanistan. And for the Kyrgyz, when it was first established, uh, this was also the security purpose. However, the base's role within Kyrgyzstan has evolved since its establishment. And uh, during the Bakiyev regime, and I would argue the latter stages of the Akayev regime, the base became viewed primarily as a domestic source of rents, income, and patronage. So this is why the United States has to pay quid pro quo to uh, establish uh, its presence in Kyrgyzstan, that it lacks the authority just because of this vital international mission to keep the base. Now, this quid pro quo has been both official in the form of rental payments that have gone from 2 million to 17 million to the current 60 million, um, but some of the quid pro quo is also tacit, and this is when we get into the business of base-related service contracts and fuel contracts. Unfortunately, both these official and these tacit payments have accrued, tended to accrue rather to Kyrgyz elites and have not benefited um, Kyrgyzstan uh, uh, and Kyrgyz development as a whole. So the base means very different things to each side. Um, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, Mr. Chairman, the base also became a symbol uh, of the U.S. indifference to regressions in uh, Kyrgyzstan's human rights and democracy. Uh, also, the base itself was viewed not only as a symbol, but as, as an actual site of um, Bakiev's greed and cronyism, right? It, it functioned as a daily reminder of what this regime had become. Um, the point I want to make in my, in my uh, remarks to you is that we learned actually the wrong lessons about the relationship between political authoritarianism, stability, and basing rights. Uh, many DOD and State Department officials I talked to pointed to the example of Uzbekistan as a cautionary tale of what can go wrong, where in 2005, after the crackdown of Uzbek security services against demonstrators in the eastern city of Andijan, 
Um, there was a wave of international criticism, including from the U.S. State Department. Uh, the Uzbek government became very concerned about our political commitment to them. Um, this was also in the middle of the colored revolutions. And this led to a series of events um, that uh, resulted in the eviction of the U.S. military from the Karshi Kanabad K-2 facility in the summer of 2005. So the lesson seems to have been learned. Don't push Central Asian governments on human rights and democracy. Uh, otherwise, you'll jeopardize the base. But the fact of the matter is that Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan have very different political cultures. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is considerably more open, uh, has a better civil society, and its security services are not as repressive and never have commanded the loyalty of the regime as they have uh, in Uzbekistan. And you saw that in both 2005 and 2010, the security services did not go to the mat um, for this uh, uh, Kyrgyz regime. So, uh, that's one thing, that we sort of thought there was this kind of one Central Asian political culture that fits all. Uh, a second point I, I would make is that we started viewing uh, uh, Bakiev's authoritarianism as in and of itself um, evidence of political stability, right? Uh, when in fact it was protests, popular protests against electricity rate hikes and against the greed and corruption of the regime uh, that led to its destabilization. So I would just make those two points. Uh, recommendations going forward, uh, we do have to mend fences with the Kyrgyz government and quickly. I think we can offer financial support for very specific goals that we can agree with. For example, helping them finance this upcoming presidential election that will be so open. Second, I think U.S. officials should publicly declare their willingness to cooperate with any Kyrgyz investigation into Bakiev era base related business practices and open these transactions to public scrutiny. I realize these are going to inconvenience certain parties, but the symbolism is important. This has to be treated as a political crisis, not as a legal matter. And one suggestion I would have is look at ways in which base-related contracts can accrue into the Kyrgyz national budget as opposed to private entities with offshore registrations. Um, finally, I think both the President and the Congress should recommit to supporting Kyrgyzstan's democratization and support the appropriate uh, programs. Uh, my final point, yes, the base was extended for a year and we're all grateful for that, but we are entering a campaign cycle now where this will become a political pinata. Uh, for populist politicians to really link the base to an unpopular U.S. support, or rather, to U.S. support of an unpopular dictator. So, as Professor Husky mentioned, it is imperative that we take these actions now and not in October when the campaign is in full swing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooley. Uh, Mr. Horton. Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, and distinguished members, it's a great honor for me to uh, appear before you today and talk about the situation in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and I want to start by noting my colleague Alex Cooley's comment. He says we need to look at this as a, a political matter rather than a legal matter. And I'll submit we have to look at it both ways. I submit that principally because I'm a lawyer and it's my duty here to look at the legal issues. Uh, and that's what I've done. But I also feel uh, that's a fundamental aspect of the political controversy in Kyrgyzstan today. This revolution, reduced to one word, was about corruption. Now, all the political leaders that I've talked with uh, agree. And in the wake of the revolution, there's a great deal of talk about the rule of law and transparency. And the question I hear thrown at me as an American when I talk with them over and over again is, what is your commitment to the rule of law and transparency? You talk about this all the time, and we don't see it in your conduct in our country. Uh, and uh, I'm ashamed to say I think they have a valid point. Um, so I looked uh, with some care about the publicly available information uh, uh, concerning the fuel contracts that were written relating uh, to Manas. And I note in my remarks that, uh, you know, we don't have the quality of information the prosecutor could use to bring a case, but I think we can draw some conclusions from this information. And the first is that there are numerous red flags of the sort traditionally used by our Department of Justice in looking at uh, bribery, bribery cases relating to public contracts which suggests strongly that we may be looking at a violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and other anti-bribery statutes. And certainly there's, uh, there's sufficient red flags to merit the opening of a formal and detailed inquiry into what transpired. 
Um, the second thing is looking at the structure of these uh, contracts and looking particularly at Red Star and Minacorp. Um, the two entities which received uh, in excess of $1 billion uh, in fuel supply contracts. Um, there are very disturbing questions concerning uh, these companies. They appear to have come out of nowhere with no prior track record of involvement in this sector. Uh, the individuals uh, involved with them uh, have uh, copious connections to the United States government, but not really very much to the fuel supply industry. Um, and the contracting relationships themselves are, in the word, extraordinary, not consistent with traditional uh, contracting rules and approaches. In fact, yesterday, uh, an article by Aaron Roston, uh, he secured and uh, released and published a memorandum of uh, agreement that was entered into between the Department of Defense and Red Star, which I examined, and I have to say I was just shocked by it. It's no nothing like a traditional contracting document. All this together shows the absence of an arm's length relationship between Red Star and the Department of Defense. And I think that's quite troubling because, of course, it's Red Star and Mina Corp that uh, historically did do contracts with President Nikayev's family. I think that that information is really quite well established and are accused of having uh, concluded similar contractual arrangements with entities controlled by President Bakiev. In any event, that accusation is out there presented very sharply by the Kyrgyz government, and it's incumbent upon us to operate transparently, get to the bottom of the facts, and admit we made a mistake if, in fact, we did. Um, uh, I also uh, am concerned about the role the U.S. Department of Justice has played in this, because after the 2005 revolution, the Justice Department did come in, did conduct an investigation, uh, and appears to have given a wink and a nod to uh, these arrangements involving uh, Red Star uh, and Mina Corp. And I think that raises serious questions in my mind about their understanding of this contract corruption issue, particularly because this occurs at a time when our Justice Department is telling us uh, that uh, procurement contract fraud is a priority for the Department of Justice. Indeed, they say it's a national security issue. And I don't see how we can reconcile the way they behaved in this case with those sorts of, of statements. Well, in the end, how our Defense Department contracts for services at Manas makes a statement about how we view Kyrgyzstan. Is this a fellow democracy that shares our values in the rule of law and transparency? Or do we view this country as congenitally corrupt and governed by competing bands of kleptocrats, where we have to use walking around money to accomplish goals, and we define the relationship only in short-term ways, because we're really not looking for a long-term relationship? Of course, the simple truth is that Kyrgyzstan is not a well-established, stable democracy. But it's also not some sort of uh, Hobbesian nightmare. The people in Kyrgyzstan have very, very high aspirations. Uh, and the question is, what's the path forward? How are we going to proceed? Are we going to work with the Kyrgyz and support their aspirations for a modern democracy uh, that lives up to the values that we both articulate? Uh, or are we going to continue dealing with them in a way that uh, shores up a corruption in the country uh, and autocratic rule? Uh, and I think the approach of the last few years is not worthy of the United States and is not worthy of Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horton. Uh, Mr. Patton. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tierney, uh, Congressman Flake, for the opportunity to speak and other members uh, on behalf of Freedom House to this subcommittee. In his novel, The Last Tycoon, Scott Fitzgerald wrote that there are no second acts in American lives. In view of recent events, a fitting question for this hearing and for those who are concerned about Kyrgyzstan's future is whether there is indeed a second act in store for Kyrgyzstan, the far distant mountainous Soviet state that's little known to the American people. I would argue that there is, if we learn the correct uh, lessons from the re recent experience, those, those lessons uh, would be the, the first application of such lessons in the former Soviet Union. In no instance since the color revolutions between 2003 and 2005 have any of the former dictators been brought to account for their crimes against their people. Unfortunately, Mr. Bakiev's exit from, from Kyrgyzstan denies the Kyrgyz people the opportunity to hold him 
and his regime to account for the crimes that he committed. However, hopefully the full investigation that other witnesses have talked about and alluded to will be conducted and there will be an opportunity to bring the Bakia family to account for, for the crimes that no other former Soviet leader has to date been called to account for. Freedom House is probably best known for the rankings that we produce each year of freedom in the world, nations in transit, taking a look at all of the countries of the former Soviet Union and indeed the world. Um, this year, we, for the first time, we downgraded Kyrgyzstan to not free in January uh, for a var variety of reasons having to do with the Bakiyev government's relationship with the media, its increasing censorship, the violence with which it dealt with journalists, and its increasing political repression. In the spirit of fairness, I took our report to the then Kyrgyz ambassador in Washington, Zamira Sadikova, who was a relatively thoughtful woman and a former journalist, much, uh, much in the same spirit as the interim leader, Rosa Otumbayeva, to have a conversation and to explain to her why Freedom House downgraded Kyr Kyrgyzstan to not free. She listened to the reasons that I laid forth and that were in our reports, and at the end of our discussion, she asked, why is it that the State Department no longer talks to us about democracy. It used to be that every sentence the State Department would say to us would include the word democracy. Now they only talk to us about trade. If your State Department does not care about democracy, why should we? I was stunned by her reaction to the report. And indeed, there is an important responsibility. Uh, much blame has been put on the Department of Defense. Uh, for the recent events that have happened in Kyrgyzstan. I think it's important to look at the role in a whole of government approach that the State Department also needs to play. We've seen in the New York Times the fairly apocryphal account of uh, an opposition leader, which has been mentioned here today, visiting the United States Embassy and uh, saying that the revolution begins on Wednesday and the diplomat with whom he spoke said, oh yeah? Um, other opposition figures, as, as we've heard, were not received at the United States Embassy. And in fact, Congress passed the Advanced uh, Dem Democratic Values Act in 2006. Uh, there is a law on the books requiring senior U.S. diplomats to actively outreach and engage opposition figures, human rights activists, and others in all countries where the United States conducts diplomatic relations. Kyrgyzstan should be no exception. The other countries of the former Soviet space should be no exception. The recent incident in Kyrgyzstan and the ongoing, uh, the ongoing tumult that comes from the events of the last two weeks puts the regional uh, situation, particularly with Kazakhstan, as the chairman of the OSCE in a unique perspective. Kazakhstan's becoming the first chairman of the OSCE east of Vienna certainly is a historic precedent. The events of the last two weeks uh, presented the first opportunity in Kazakhstan's chairmanship of the OSCE to actively engage in a constructive way to diffuse violence, uh, to put monitors on the ground, and work in the process of healing the country of Kyrgyzstan. They failed. Uh, they failed to deploy ODIR, which had the monitors and the resources necessary to engage, and instead reverted to old-style former Soviet diplomacy, uh, in effect uh, whisking Bakiev off through Kazakhstan to Belarus, where he safely sits today. I think that's an important lesson looking forward about just the role of multilateral institutions in the OSC in particular, and how it was intended to, uh, to, to be used in situations like this, and how perhaps in the, in, in the balance of Kazakhstan's chairmanship, uh, uh, it, can, it can do a better job. Looking also in the regional perspective, there are lessons to be learned here with respect to uh, Uzbekistan in particular. And the, the, the case was raised that Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan are not uh, uh, similar in many circumstances. However, the lessons are the same. The lessons that, the, uh, that we've learned in Kyrgyzstan is backing up a single dictator does not put us in a very good position when a revolution happens. The question with Uzbekistan is not if the revolution will happen, but when it will happen. And do we want to be in the same position uh, sitting here at this table wondering what happened when things do change in Uzbekistan as we are today? Um, a careful look and review of the situation and how Kyrgyzstan got to where it is hopefully will put us in a better position when that comes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Patton. Thank all of our witnesses for your testimony, both written and oral. It's, it's been informative on that. We're going to go into a question and answer period here, about five minutes per, uh, per member, and we'll go around more than one cycle if that's uh, amenable to all the witnesses and, and the members desire it. Uh, 
You know, Mr. Patton, it's, it's not unusual for the United States. We go back in our history, unfortunately, and find out uh, how often diplomatically we've chosen to support somebody who was authoritarian in nature or convenient to moving our priorities forward as opposed to keeping those open contacts with opposition leaders as well and, and playing a different role. Pakistan comes to mind, General Musharraf, and, and uh, as a more recent thing, but it goes on and on. Let me ask first, though, to all the witnesses here. I, I'm hearing that um, it's a good idea to do this investigation. It's a good idea to do it early on. Uh, it's a good idea to be as inclusive and thorough as we can be. And yet, on the other hand, I'm hearing that uh, doing that may give fodder to uh, sort of a pinata sort of uh, situation uh, in the elections coming up in that country. So can you weigh or balance for me the pros and cons of that? In any order, people want to speak up. Uh, Ms. Dr. Cooley, you've been nodding away. Do you want to speak first? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I think the base is going to be a pinata or whether we have the investigation or not. I think candidates are positioning themselves. They have all the fodder that they need uh, to make these connections. And again, uh, this operates in Kyrgyz political space. This is regardless of you know, what the intentions may or may not have been on the part of the state or DOD. The base will be an issue. That is why having an investigation, uh, uh, being contrite about some of the arrangements, all of this is important to give uh, uh, domestic political support to those factions, to those candidates that want to maintain the base and have good relations with the U.S. Sure, Mr. Horton, go ahead. Could just add, I think investigations are occurring because the Kyrgyz side is conducting an investigation. And while we talk about transparency, uh, actually, I think all of, uh, all of us who have tried to look into the issues surrounding these contracts have discovered very quickly we can get much more detailed information much more quickly in Bishkek than we can get it in Washington. There are prosecutors out there right now doing detailed investigations. Information is circulating about the pricing of the fuel contracts right now, copies of the documents.